definitely seeing a ghost. When was the last time you saw the bike? Uh, actually, I saw it at uh, the bub meet when Larry Feast brought it uh, brought it in to sell it. But before that, uh, the last time I saw it was before we were even running the lakes through with Theo. Uh, probably 1981 or two. Yeah, jeez, little GP carburetors and everything. Yeah, it's pretty much just like it sat, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Do you recognize any of the stickers? They're kind of Yeah, they're kind up. of eroded from when... They used to be a little more legible, but there, there's a sticker here for just about every time he uh, wrote it. Wow, so there's and dozens of them. A couple of them from the times I wrote it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were you writing it uh, El Mirage or Bonneville? El Mirage, yeah. yeah. I rode this a couple of times for him, and then when he built his Lakester with a Triumph engine in it, he had a, a Harley Servicar uh, rear axle and differential. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they got it all built, he couldn't fit into it. So I was the only one narrow enough to get into it. So uh, I was the uh, designated driver. So I drove it uh, quite a few times. Then they finally widened it so Theo could get in it, and uh, he climbed in it, put his helmet and fire suit on, climbed into it. He got into it, and then he just freaked out. He got uh, claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. So I just kept kept driving it until the one time he did drive it, and that was the time he crashed it. Yeah. Was that powered with this motor, or was that a? a you know, I I thought he had the engine out of this in it, but he had several engines. Yeah. So. Uh, I don't remember if it was actually the engine out of this bike, but uh, it ran just about as well as the <laughs> bike did. <laughs> Can you remember anything about the specifics of the bike? Uh, as far as the cams and stuff go, um, I thought he had some Harman Collins cams at one time. He had. Uh, uh, of course, we used to change cams like we changed underwear. Yeah. Had Q cams in it at one point, and uh, I think this. Uh, I mean, the engine has changed uh, quite a bit throughout the years. He ran it for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's got bigger um, lifter block uh, or bigger pushrod tubes on it, which looks like it might still have a Harman and Collins roller tappet conversion in it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably still got the Harman and Collins cams. Right. Yeah, he had uh, had that roller set up and uh, needed more clearance at the uh, tappet boss for the push rods and everything and the, and the tops of the rollers. Hmm. But this is a uh, nine bolt top end. It's a later model top end. It's not uh, not the top end that was made to go on the engine to begin yeah. with. Right. And uh, back then, if it uh, if it was bigger, it was better, so uh, we usually went with performance rather than uh, these days. We run, we would run this bike in a vintage class, but it wouldn't be legal because of the, the later model top end. Right, right. Where this bike is pushing the envelope a little bit because it has an aluminum head, but it's an eight-bolt head. Mm, yeah. So they say if it's an eight-bolt head, it's okay. Mm. So if we were going to resurrect this and run vintage with it, which we don't have to. If you want to run it, you don't have to run vintage. You could run Push a, rod, a yeah. gas or a, a fuel motorcycle and uh, just run pushrod class. You said you might have, they, he ran this on alcohol sometimes? Yeah, oh yeah. That's why we called it the Nitro Express. He ran uh, good loads of nitro in it. Hmm. And uh, it was kind of a hit and miss deal Every once in a while, he'd get lucky and go fast. He went over 140 miles an hour with it at El Mirage right. at one point. And there were a lot of 120 mile an hour runs, too, to get there. Right, yeah. right. So, uh, and he probably wasn't concerned with any particular part, just having the parts around. I mean, we see a lot of stuff on the bike that's, you know, really considered super vintage speed parts nowadays. And Yeah. Well, see... When Theo started running this, uh, I was running an old iron Harley, either the, the Ironhead Harley or the uh, K model, and these were just old motorcycles. Mm -hmm. They weren't 
you know, we didn't really consider them vintage motorcycles. They were just old motorcycles we had around. And uh, now people look at, oh, it's a vintage motorcycle, you know. <laughs> so we run in the vintage class. But, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you don't run a, against rice grinders with a, mm -hmm. with a push rod triumph. Mm -hmm. So we try to run the push rod class or vintage. And uh, I remember one time I, I rode this and it was, uh, had a good load of uh, nitro in it and uh, took off really good and it just uh, kind of leaned over and uh, we pulled the head off afterwards and it had a hole in both cylinders and both pistons. <laughs> <laughs> sort of end of the day racing there. Yeah, yeah. What's different um, from when you rode it? You know, what do you see? I mean, I know the the yeah. later unit top end, but what else stands out? It's that? it's it's identical. Yeah. Yeah. There's no. That's it, just the, the way it was. The main thing. My legs were a little bit longer than Theo's. He had he wasn't short, but he had a longer upper body than me and shorter legs. So it was a little bit awkward for me to ride it because of the uh, uh, the way my legs were. Did you sit but, back uh, on the? Oh yeah, when I got uh, going on it, I was tucking into the paint as far as I could. Mm. My butt was mm. way back there. Hmm. My knees were up to my chin and. Uh, yeah. The photos we saw of Theo, he looked like a stocky guy, you know, he was, wasn't a small yeah. guy or anything. He yeah. Pretty, uh... yeah, he was, no, in no means was he a small guy, but he was just built a little bit different. His mm. torso was longer and he had shorter legs. Right. Mm. Yeah. But he fit on it great and it, uh, this is really something. Did you put the panic button on here for any particular reason or just something you had? Uh, that's something somebody put on, I don't know what mm. to do. <laughs> You know anything about that? Uh, there's a coil with a couple uh, wires yeah, coming down right. there, and that's something we haven't sorted out what what it's there for. If you look down in there under the primary. Well, it looks like a Triumph coil. Mm -hmm. uh, Not sure why I would have needed it with a Magneto no, bike, though. No, uh, although I have uh, in a pinch. One time I was at Daytona and my Magneto on the KR Harley went out. So I, uh, I used the Magneto as a set of points and I went to the auto parts store and mounted a coil just like that and a battery and uh, ran a coil ignition. If his uh, Magneto had gone out, which these uh, British units uh, do once in a while, he may have done that just, for, uh, just to get by. You know, it's interesting, Wes, remember in that, uh, with some of the other stuff we got, it was a kind of crudely made battery tray it looked like. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, maybe that was yeah. part of a, a fix and maybe it was towards you the end of the probably had a little battery back here and uh, yeah. just, just use the Magneto for the points. Yeah, maybe it was a quick quick yeah. setup and that was when, I, you know, it was just never removed as a backup. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting. Because then, I think it was leading, uh, there was a little toggle, wasn't there or something? I thought I could trace the wires. I don't remember that. This will go up to uh, either a kill button or a... Yeah, there's yeah. a kill button on the bar. I thought there was a lead coming from the coil. Maybe it was just the ground. Did it have any kind of seat or anything down here? It seems to me there was something there, but it wasn't uh, wasn't anything for comfort. Just a pad or something. I just had a uh, pad or even a piece of a, a metal over there. Yeah, we found a part of an old pad in the box of stuff when we mm -hmm. found the bike, or when oh, we got the bike. Yeah. yeah. That's probably what it was. Yeah. Uh, it, there's really uh, would be no reason to have anything there. Mm. Like my Harley, it doesn't have any kind of a seat to speak of. It just uh, you're not on the bike that long to where you need uh, any great comfort. Right. But uh, most of the time, you would end up being in a position back like like this, back as far as you could get, and then tucked in. Mm-hmm and uh, just basically looking through the uh, forks. Yeah. <laughs> and holding on, huh? Yeah. I think we just lift it up. There we go. Do you remember making the oil tank? No, I, I don't remember any of that. Seems like a pretty trick welding job for the mid-1960s. Yeah. Remember 
those carburetors. In fact, I remember these carburetors when they were on the Lakester. Yep. I think he used the same carburetors on both uh, both bikes. The hmm. dual matchbox floats on there. And yeah. It's got huge mains in there. Yeah. Well, that's why it's got such big mains is the uh, mm. alcohol and nitro. Yeah. We ran it with, with uh, 110. And it seemed to be running fine, but we just never actually pulled the plugs afterward to look and see, yeah. you know, how rich it was running. Yeah, when we got it, we fiddled around with it for about five or six hours and blasted it up and down the parking lot a couple times. All right. Just because we couldn't resist. Yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Right. That's great. So when did you start racing? Oh, I was racing go-karts and quarter midgets when I was a kid. How long ago was that? That was about 65 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's see, I, I was uh, doing uh, go-karts probably in the uh, mid to late 50s and up into the early 60s. I, I started uh, racing motorcycles uh, not dry lakes, lakes or uh, Bonneville, but uh, scrambles and flat track in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, El Mirage, as far as racing uh, at El Mirage, it was about uh, the late, si late 50s, early 60s. No, 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 let's see. Late 60s and the early 70s is when I started racing uh, Bonneville and El Mirage. Mm -hmm. I ran a couple of years at El Mirage before I raced at Bonneville. I think my first year at Bonneville was 72, 71 or 72. So, uh, yeah, one of the first people I uh, met because he was a biker was Theo. Mm. And uh, uh, he was a rod rider and so was I, so we were pretty close. Right. And, uh, yeah, at one time he was the president of the Rod Riders. And, uh, yeah. Any reason why he was president for only six months? Uh, we probably kicked him out. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed a lot of the guys who were president stayed president uh, for years, and he's, yeah, he was six yeah. months only. Some guys have a hard time getting the meetings, you know, because of where they live and so on. Although, uh, at that time, the meetings were uh, uh, in, in the area where Theo lived, or not too far. Uh, we used to have them in uh, Commerce, and then we had them up in uh, uh, Pasadena when we were at uh, Lonnie Huss's place. From there, it went to Pomona, and uh, I think we were at uh, uh, Mike Cook's shop down in, uh, oh, geez, where was that? Not Maywood, just up from Maywood. But Theo lived in that area. Yeah. So. Uh, what was it like um, racing old bikes at that time in the early 70s, late 60s? Well, when I started racing in El Mirage, uh, it was just an old bike. They weren't vintage bikes. They were just an old bike that was beat up enough to where he wanted to make a race bike out of mm -hmm. it. And uh, basically, that's, that's what we did. We got something that uh, wasn't real cherry that we'd want to ride on the street, and you'd... Uh, throw some pieces at it and, uh, you know, pull the engine apart and change the cams and do a little port work and this, that, and the other and mm -hmm. make yourself a race bike. Do you know how long the, Theo was racing um, before you got there? Quite a t He was racing in the early, early 50s. Mm. And uh, uh, I didn't know him then. I, I met him when I joined the Rod Riders, but... Um, there were times when it seemed like uh, we were the only two bikes on the uh, the dry lakes, hmm. and uh, it wasn't until uh, I think the um, late 70s, maybe even the early 80s, to where uh, they would even recognize uh, motorcycles for for top points. They eventually now they have a, a top points uh, trophy for cars, and they always have but uh, they didn't have one for motorcycles. And then if you got top points, you got a jacket. Well, we never got no a jackets jacket. back then. We were lucky to get a trophy, you know, <laughs> or anything. You said something about the but, Top uh, Banana Award. What was that all yeah. about? See, they, they didn't have uh, top points for motorcycles, so we'd 
take a bunch of bananas with us when we went to the races. And after it was all over, the guy that was fastest, we'd hand him a, a banana. <laughs> so the guy that ended up with the most bananas was the winner. <laughs> so finally they did uh, recognize motorcycles, and there is a uh, top points for motorcycles now. And uh, uh, I've, I've had top points two or three times, but uh, several times before we were recognized. Mm -hmm. I mean, they said, well, yeah, you got the top points motorcycle, but uh, we're not going to give you a jacket or anything, yeah. you know. So there was maybe a little bit of, I wouldn't say anti-motorcycle bias, but definitely pro-car bias? Yeah, but now we're, we're, you know, a big part of the show. Mm -hmm. You know, the cars are definitely the, the top billing, but uh, now it's almost equal as far as the motorcycles go. And a lot more people with money and... Uh, a lot more involvement, uh, sponsorship-wise, and so on. Right. And we've always been a just a fly-by-night, uh, you know, <laughs> shoestring type operation, and uh, we uh, siphon gas out of junkyard cars to get back and forth <laughs> to the races and uh, do all our own work and everything. As you know, Theo did most of his own work. Yeah. When he got into the Lakester, he had some uh, friends that were pretty good fabricators that helped build the uh, Lakester, mm -hmm. and they did an excellent job on the Lakester. And uh, uh, I, I don't understand with all that technology why the thing was such an ill-handling piece. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, it, it's. Uh, did you or Theo ever win the top banana? Um, oh yeah. 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 In fact, uh, back then there were so few motorcycles. There was only. Yeah. Four, four or five of us involved in the top banana award, so somebody had to win it. And, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, we'd we'd show up at El Mirage, uh, you know, Saturday afternoon, and uh, we'd get set up in our pits. And uh, of course, back then there was a lot of uh, drinking going on. You know, a lot of beers were <laughs> were passed around, and uh, at night we'd have a bonfire and. Uh, we used to burn tires, and uh, <laughs> yeah, we'd pull a hood off of somebody's 49 Packard and knock the buzzard off it and uh, <laughs> tie a rope on it and tow each other around the lake bed on it. <laughs> pull flaming tires and all kinds of stuff. But, uh, all the stuff they don't allow you to do. Yeah, the BLM <laughs> doesn't, uh, doesn't like you to do stuff like that No glass that containers now and all that. But, uh, <laughs> I think uh, you know, a good portion of it was was due to the uh, the flow of alcohol that was consumed. Mm, right, right. And uh, now most of the alcohol is consumed uh, inside the campers and the motorhomes. Right, and right. You don't see too many stag staggering racers. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, what do you remember about Theo's? Um, did he have a family or? The only family I knew of was uh, his buddies in the uh, in the club mm -hmm. and uh, at the races and. Uh, he had quite a following. Okay. Um, what do you remember about Theo having a family or? Never knew any real family members. Uh, he had a lot of friends in the club and uh, a lot of people would come out and uh, watch us race that were real good friends of Theo's. And uh, after he quit running, uh, people would come out and say, where's Theo? Where's Theo? You know? and. Uh, Nobody could seem to answer that uh, question. After his accident, uh, well, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, with the Lakester, um, when they originally built it, he couldn't fit into it. So I was the skinny guy in the group, so I was a designated driver. So I drove the thing. I was also running my Roadster pickup at the time. So I'd run my Roadster pickup, and they'd be spaced a few cars behind me in line. And I'd come around and park the Roadster and jump out and get into the uh, Lakester make a run in the Lakester. Hmm. And uh, it didn't really handle too good. It, uh, it wanted to, uh, uh, it got into some pretty good tank slappers, but if you tried to back off on it, it got worse. So you'd have to hit the throttle and eventually it would smooth out and go okay. And uh, when you turned out to the left, for some reason you could decelerate and even brake slightly and, uh, and it, it wouldn't wobble. But if you're in a straight line, it would wobble like heck. Hmm. So I ran the thing probably, uh, oh, for the first season they had it together. And then the second season they widened it so he could fit into it. And he got into it and uh, got claustrophobia and had to get right back out. 
So uh, there was one time we were close to each other in line, and I took off in my roadster, and when I came back, Theo had actually gotten into the car and decided to run it himself. And uh, I was just coming back when he took off from the line, and uh, he got it up to about 100 miles an hour, and it started wobbling on him, so he put the brakes on, tried to stop, and it got worse, and it, it pencil rolled first, and then did a couple of endos, and wow. uh, it uh, broke him up pretty good. Yeah. And he came out to the lakes in a wheelchair several times after the accident, and then the last time I saw him, he was just on crutches. Hmm. And uh, then it, he just, uh, so Theo gets in the car and uh, he takes off and gets up to about 100 miles an hour, maybe a little more, and it starts uh, wobbling on him. So uh, instead of staying with it and pushing on the throttle to power through it, he hit the brakes and the car went sideways and the pencil rolled and then it endowed and uh, it uh, shook him up pretty bad. and. Uh, Broke him out. He broke his legs and ankles, and uh, he came out to the the lakes uh, several times after that in a wheelchair. And uh, then one time he came out and he was just on crutches, and that that was actually the last time I saw him. But uh, he had a lot of a lot of his friends would uh, continue to come out, and whenever they saw me, they'd, they'd say, "Where, well, where's Theo?" And uh, I don't know. And uh, he had. Evidently, move. He was. He had a shop, and he uh, he lived in the shop, and uh, he left there, and he was living with somebody else, and I could never figure out who he was living with, and same with his friends. They could never figure out where he went. It's just like he uh, he disappeared off the face of the earth. Right. Then we heard he had died, and. Uh, and this is in the early '80s when he disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. When did you hear he I died? So. Was it that not long after? Uh, it was, a, I think, a couple of years, two or three years later, um, maybe even more than that. But he had died uh, before I heard about it by yeah. by some time. In fact, uh, there were people who were saying, "Where's Theo?" and uh, we were wondering where he was, and uh, not knowing he had died. Right. But uh, uh, I didn't really. Uh, there, there was nobody ever got a hold of us about a funeral or any kind of a service, and uh, uh, like I say, it was just like he had vanished from the face of the earth, mm -hmm. and I didn't know where the motorcycle was or the lakester. I imagine the the guys that fabricated the lakester probably ended up with most of the pieces, and uh, I was very surprised when Larry Feast ended up with the bike, and he said he got it from someone over in Lake Elsinore. Mm. And um, that's what he told me at the time. I don't know for a fact. Uh, David, but he never I think it was David, but he'd forgotten the guy's last name. Yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah. This is like seeing a ghost. Like I say, it's. Uh, <laughs> Apparently, uh, David or whoever was had it. I think had it a long period of time, right? I mean, the right. impression we got from Larry was that he had it for quite a while. Yeah. Do you think Theo could have lasted up until the early 2000s? I really don't know, because when when he quit coming to the lakes, it was just like nobody knew where he was, mm -hmm. and I, I have no idea what year he died. Um, like I say, when I when I heard that he had died, he had died some time before. Mm -hmm. Do you know was he a, a military vet veteran? I have the feeling that he was. I don't know for sure, but uh, something in the back of my mind said that he was in the military. Yeah. We found some military records online that had his name. Theophile Ozen was a name on it. But mm -hmm. I think it would have died in 03 or 04. Right. So we didn't know. I mean, it could be totally unrelated. But yeah. Um, we thought it was kind of curious that the bike showed up around 2004 and we found this reference to him, to some Theophile Ozen dying in 2003 been, uh, or so. Aviation huh. mechanic, I think, in World War II. So, that you know, could be. That could be. Those, that mm -hmm. made us think it kind of, that kind of fit, but it could be just totally a coincidence, you know? Mm hmm. Mm. Can you ask him what kind of guy he was, his personality and stuff like that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, he, he was. Um, once you got oh, to. Uh, actually, what, what, what kind of guy was Theo? Oh, uh, <laughs> once you got to know him, he was a great guy. Yeah. Uh, if you didn't know him, uh, he seemed to be kind of a grubby guy, and uh, uh, you didn't really know what to think of him. But uh, very, very smart. 
uh, borderline genius, I'd say. And uh, uh, when you talk to him, he, he, you didn't get the impression that, uh, and the way he talked was a lot different from the way he looked. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember he, he'd come to the banquets once in a while and he'd have a suit on. And it was like, whoa, you know, Theo, you got a suit on. What, what's happening here, you know? But uh, he looked very distinguished with a suit on. But uh, usually he was just a grubby guy like me and <laughs> most of the other guys that uh, right. you know, did bikes. Do you remember uh, Elmo Gillette? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's, uh, he's my, uh, my second father. Oh, really? He says yeah. hello. I talked to him on the phone the other day. All right. Yeah, he's... Uh, kind of gone a little downhill in the last uh, few years. He's had a couple of strokes, mm -hmm. but uh, he was with us in the filming of the World's Fastest Indian. Mm. You know his son and, as well? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. His uh, son th um, remembers Theo as a black guy. Um, if he had, if he was black, he was a very light black. And I'm sure there was uh, other uh, influence I was, uh, he could have been uh, like Milano or something like that. Middle Eastern but, uh, or something. Uh, but he did have uh, like uh, uh, brushy hair, you know, kind of curly hair. But I never looked at him as being black. Right. He could be. There's a lot of real light colored blacks. Probably nobody else did either. He, he was, was just another guy on the lakes. area. There were a lot of blacks in the area he was from. But, right. Uh, I, never yeah, the only I never even thought of it. Until you mentioned it. Yeah, the only Ozens we found in our just internet searches were either Turkish or they were black people down in Compton. I, or you know, I got the imp uh, more Turkish impression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, by the name. Right. You know. And then if his full name was Theophile, that sounds very. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds very Turkish. Yeah. To me. Yeah, we haven't found anyone like looking for family under the name Ozen. Anyone who seems to know anything about. Yeah. About him, you know. Uh, Elmo would probably know. Elmo used to run, uh, well, they used, they used to run uh, top fuel dragsters before they got into dry lakes, but uh, he ran a uh, Falcon with a small block uh, Ford in it called Gillette's Blue Blade. Hmm. It was a little blue uh, 62 Falcon. And they went quite fast with it. And he was in on some other uh, lakesters and uh, streamliners. And then they, when Jim Latin started. Uh, racing dry lakes, he and Jim Latin got together and is all, also always Latin and Gillette on the Redhead Streamliner right, and right. like that. Big names. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, he, he would be, uh, he would have known Theo long before mm -hmm. myself. Elmo said uh, he was the first person on the scene of the wreck, but he didn't seem to remember too much. Yeah. You know, he said he was w or one of the first people. Yeah. Of the uh, the Lakester, you know. Right, right. Now, when you say Lakester, describe that a little bit. Okay, it was uh, it had a Harley servicar rear end and Harley rear wheels, and it had a uh, I think it was a fabricated front axle with probably Anglia spindles, and uh, I'm trying to remember what it had. Uh, probably some motorcycle wheels on the front, and it was a tubular chassis. It was. Uh, uh, for its time, it was fairly high tech, uh, all welded uh, chrome alley, hmm. Healy art, and uh, uh, very nicely done. And uh, the the rest of the Lakester was so nice, the uh, the Harley Servicar axle kind of looked antiquated. Mm. But uh, that's what Theo wanted to do, and it it worked. I. I to this day, I can't figure out why it didn't handle better than it did because it had uh, a very nice front end and the geometry was all set up and had a nice slow steering box. But uh, maybe the steering needed to be slowed down even more. But uh, it was uh, very low and uh, it took a bit to get into it. You laid basically flat on your back and your head was stuffed between the roll bar, those roll bar padding that would just basically hold your helmet. And I can remember uh, on a couple of my runs, the thing vibrated so much that my head got twisted in the roll bar padding. At the end of the run, my head was, you know, about <laughs> like this. And uh, 
it uh, it was kind of hard to get in and out of. Uh, these days, it'd probably be illegal because you're supposed to be able to get in and out of your car in a certain amount of time. Right. But uh, yeah, it was it was a nice car. It. Uh, too bad it got wrecked. I think if it were straightened out, it would be a 140 mile an hour hmm. Lakester with that Triumph engine in it. So you think it was pretty solidly uh, constructed then? Oh yeah, yeah. And you guys always felt good about the the bikes you rode and and all that, despite their ribald appearance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were probably a little more naive back then. Uh, I've always been one to push the envelope a little bit on some of my uh, safety features and tires and so on. <laughs> like uh, this particular tire here, the tire and wheel came off of my uh, Harley. And they told me the tire was too old 15 years ago. So I replaced, I built my own, uh, I got a spool and some stainless steel spokes and a, uh, uh, a sun rim. and. Put a wheel together, and then I got a Goodyear uh, Pro Stock uh, drag tire that I run on the Harley, and uh, even it, it's uh, 10 years old now. But this, I just had it laying around. So when it, this was a road racer, and they they didn't let us run it in competition because of the supercharger anymore. So I decided to turn it into a dry lakes bike, and. Uh, so I took the old wheel and tire off the Harley, and it went through tech with no problem. Of course, <laughs> they knew this, this bike wasn't going to go over 125 miles an hour. So with the Harley, we were going 170 was our best time with a, the old iron Harley. Wow. So um, the back tire is a pretty nice tire, but uh, they consider this to be a rag now, and I do have another tire that I'm replacing it with. The problem is these, these uh, small section tires now are hard to find. Um, uh, the one I'm replacing it with is like one size bigger than this. It's just about a quarter of an inch taller and a little wider. And uh, that's the smallest tire you can get now. Mm -hmm. yeah, unless you get a, a moped tire and they're not legal for uh, racing. Yeah. So. Uh, for the Speedmaster you're going to replace it with? Avon Speedmaster? Um, I'm trying to remember what I got for it. It's an Avon, yeah, I think it's a, it was sitting there in the shed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. same rib style and everything. Uh, no, actually, it's yeah. got a little different uh, tread yeah. style. But uh, as you can see, the back tire on Theo's uh, bike, it was an old tire when he got it. Yeah, it's a 20-incher, <laughs> uh, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah. But we, uh, uh, the less tread on a tire, the uh, less chance it has of actually blowing up or throwing a tread. So mm -hmm. we used to shave the tires. If we didn't have a tire shaver, we'd spin it and use a, a real coarse disc grinder. You can mm. see the, uh, the tooling mm -hmm. marks on this. You know, yeah. when you look at it, you'll mm -hmm. see it along the edges. It looks like it was shaved. Yeah, they used to have uh, uh, shaving uh, uh, machines that would spin the tire and actually shave it off with a cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get that, uh, okay. that texture from. When did you put uh, Spirit of Theo Ozen on the seat on that bike? I did that quite a while ago, probably uh, 10 years ago. And uh, it was actually, we hadn't even switched it over to Dry Lake's bike. This thing still has the uh, shocks on it that we used to road race with. But uh, yeah, we, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, when I got this Triumph, I, uh, I used to think of Theo a lot. and. Uh, just put Spirit of Theo Ozen, Nitro Express, and uh, you asked me if uh, we ran uh, fuel in this bike. Well, it wasn't named Nitro Express because we ran gasoline. <laughs> and we were uh, heavy into nitro. Yeah. So it's, it's How long have you had this bike? I'm trying to think. Probably about 15 years. Mm. Yeah. Where did you get it? A uh, guy at the uh, El Camino swap meet had it one year. Hmm. A friend of mine told me about it and I said, well, I don't have uh, I don't have the money to buy that. And then another friend of mine who was with me, he had some money and uh, <laughs> I had a little bit of money and Jim Latin was there and he said, well, here, I'll loan you some money. And <laughs> so we, uh, I think we paid $1,200 for it at the time, but you know, I've done a lot of work to it. Right. It was well worth it. Um, it was actually a steal at the time, but uh, 
Uh, I eventually, uh, Terry Lewis was uh, my partner on it, and he decided he didn't want to have anything to do with it, and uh, hmm. so I bought him out, and I paid Latin back, and uh, the thing sat for quite a while, and then we got it running, and it wasn't, like I say, they wouldn't let us run it anymore uh, on the road race circuit. I could run at exhibition, mm. and that was it. So we just uh, decided, well, it's going to be a, a Dry Lakes and Bonneville bike. And uh, I ran it at El Mirage a couple of times, and then we took it to Bonneville, and my wife uh, rode it at uh, Bonneville, and she right. got a record with it. And uh, it's got uh, several records at the AMA bub meet. Really? And I think we ran uh, uh, M, M blown gas one year, and then the next year, uh, in order to change classes, we put a Frisbee on the front of it and uh, run partial streamline partial stream blown gas. <laughs> With a Frisbee. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they weren't real heavy records, but uh, there's something to build on. Right, right. Once we get the, well, my son shredded the blower belt at the Antique Nationals. Hmm. So the belts we replaced uh, with, they stretched and uh, we lost uh, boost. Mm. So when I get the right belts back on it, it's it's I think it's a 120 mile an hour machine without uh, getting too much into the engine because I, I don't want to start putting a lot of money and fancy stuff into it because it's such a period piece. Right, right. I, I don't want to do that. So I'm satisfied with what it's done and. Uh, what would you think about us getting this bike back out on the lakes and taking it to Bonneville? I think that that's the thing to do, for sure. And it wouldn't take that much to do it. Just yeah. uh, grease it up a little bit and uh, <laughs> check a few things. And, uh, we may have to consult you on the, uh, on the nitro. <laughs> get, get Gail to mix up some, uh, a light load of uh, nitro and methanol. But we'll look at the jets and see what, uh, what the jets say, and that'll tell us uh, how much nitro. Right. But I think we should just run some alcohol in it and bring the jet sizes down a little bit and then add a little bit of nitro to it here and there. Mm -hmm. Sounds so easy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it is. It's, it's not hard. I mean, you got everything you need there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it just... Uh, well, our plan is to take it out to uh, El Mirage in, uh, in May and get it tacked and yeah. see what we need to do to, if there's any surprises on what needs to be done to it. Make and sure then, the, the steering damper works, and it's got a chain guard. Um, you know, it's just, uh, you've got a positive on and off switch for the uh, Need uh, new chill. tires. You know, new yeah, tire. they definitely want you to put new tires on it. And uh, primary cover, you know, it's got to be finagled. Yeah, the they, uh, they made me put this piece of strap across there. They thought I was going to get my uh, foot, tore off. foot <laughs> caught in it. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, Safe to wear the axles on that. And they'll, yeah. they'll let you run those old tires, but they uh, <laughs> but they want a belt guard on the yeah. uh, on the primary. But uh, just the way it is, it's 90 percent. So all you yeah. gotta do is a little safety wire here and there. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got uh, tires and safety wire. Yeah, we want to show you a couple things we uh, we picked up with the bike. Do you remember uh, this tree of sprockets? It's pretty insignificant, but I got this from uh, Larry Fees at the uh, at one of the Rosamond swap meets out there, uh, oh, one of Yoshi's deals. Yeah. And uh -huh. um, I asked him what they look. They look to me like old, you know, Triumph sprockets. And I asked him, I said, you know, where did these come from? And he said, oh, they came off an old Triumph Lakes bike. And of course, I didn't need them, <laughs> especially at the time. But I thought, oh, well, that's cool. They came off an old Triumph Lakes bike, and I bought them. Paid mm -hmm. Larry way too much money. And uh, in talking to him. He said these, this sprocket tree came with that bike. Yeah. Well, these are uh, interesting because uh, what happens is a stock Triumph sprocket, um, aside from the fact that they wear, uh, if you want to change gear ratios, it's a real hassle to change the uh, transmission sprocket. Mm -hmm. So normally what you do you have an extra chain and you change the engine sprocket. But you can also change the rear sprocket if you've got the right size sprockets. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, in order to make it go faster, you want a smaller sprocket. So what some people would do is turn the original sprocket down um, and either remachine it, which is a real 
job, although I've, I know people who have actually taken a drill press and made their own sprockets by drilling holes and then filing, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, uh, some guys would uh, machine these sprockets down and make a flange and then rivet or put another sprocket on it to get the size sprocket yeah. they wanted. Mm -hmm. And then they would have to space the, make the, make a, usually in order to have a flange here, you'd have about a 3 sixteenths to a quarter of an inch mismatch on your chain alignment. So you had to make some spacers to, to align the sprocket. Huh. But, uh, there's other one. It was a lot of, a lot of work. A lot of the, uh, uh, flat trackers would just put an overlay sprocket on it, right? And then they had uh, barns, uh, hubs, and stuff where you didn't. Once even, things got fancier, you didn't have to use these stupid uh, cast iron brake drums. Yeah, you can see how that one's cut on anymore. Yeah. Do you recognize these sprockets from anything in particular, as far as if these I are modified? I'm trying to remember uh, the notches. where the notches uh, came from. Uh, you can go to a a bearing supply or industrial supply and buy blank sprockets and cut them out to any size you want. But this this was a uh, typical thing to do in the in the uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, do you remember actually swapping the rear sprocket on the? I remember doing sprocket? the engine sprocket a couple of times, yeah. but uh, we never did the rear sprocket. I used to run, uh, on my Harley, I run a stock brake drum to begin with, and the smallest sprocket you could get was a 49, and most of them came with a 52. Mm -hmm. Oh, this, boy. This stuff came with the bike as well. Yeah. 126, November 79. 79. El Mirage. Yeah. First place. That would have been... Yeah, that was first place in his class. Mm. B fuel motorcycle. What's the B for? Um, it was a class B. Uh, 650 cc's was a, at the time, they had about three or four different ways during the last uh, 20 years that they uh, separated the uh, designations. Mm -hmm. The way they do it now, they just say 650 cc blown gas mm -hmm. push rod motorcycle or whatever, but uh, I remember one of mine was E-Fuel e motorcycle, but uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's neat. 1979, what, what do you got there? This is a, uh, what is that, May 83. 117.865. Yeah. Yeah, this would have been first place in his class. Mm -hmm. And these were definitely motorcycle, even though they. Oh had yeah, cars they used to them. put the cars on them. It wasn't until uh, uh, mid '80s or early '80s that uh, Tom Evans came up with a uh, really neat motorcycle uh, um, trophy, and we took castings off it, and we've used that ever since. Mm -hmm. We always thought it was weird we'd get a motorcycle trophy and it had a car on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It Did you know about the, uh, the class on that one, the J slash FL? Oh, wait a minute. This is uh, 83. This would be uh, J Fuel Lakester. So that was for the car. This is for the wow. for the Lakester. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 117 mm -hmm. and change. Yeah. I probably drove the car to, got, to get this trophy. Wow. I was going to ask you about that. Is Theo only drove it once. The one time? Yeah. But he got hurt. And he got so hurt. Some of the times you ran the bike or the Lakester, it would be under his name. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I, I looked through uh, some timing sheets looking for your name and thought that might have been the case. Yeah. You know? yeah, it was always registered under uh, Theo's name. Hmm. See, I, I, don't, I think I was the only one to run the Lakester other than the time Theo ran it. Hmm. Yeah. So that might have been your trophy. <laughs> yeah. It was his trophy. I was just the driver. <laughs> There's his uh, the uh, Rod Riders plaque. Yeah. From when he was president. Mm-hmm. Get his gavel here. <laughs> Come to order.
Yeah. <laughs> Neat stuff. That's real wood too. Yeah. yeah. I can imagine yeah. this hanging up, you know. Pretty much been pretty proud of these. Oh yeah. And then we have a bunch of uh, timing slips or just records from El Mirage. Mm -hmm. Starting in 67. 67, yeah. yeah. And then uh, he's in here a couple times, or the bike is. Including mm -hmm. uh, the one over over buck 40. Mm -hmm. That's in there. Yeah. There's a 93 miles an hour. Right there. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's pretty good variation from no time. Yeah, to... it was, like I say, it was a hit and miss deal, and uh, Theo... If he thought it needed uh, a couple of changes, uh, he'd make two or three changes, and then the sometimes time. that would that would yeah. set you back. Right, mm -hmm. right. Two Where, ones. you know, if you if you do it scientifically, you uh, uh, try to make one change at a time unless you're absolutely sure of what you're doing. Right. Yeah. Do you remember how fast you went on the bike? Uh, one time I went close to 120 and other time it was uh, very very slow like about 85 or 90. Yeah here's a 131 Theo Ozen. Yeah. When was that from? Yeah I never went that fast on the bike. I think it was that's uh, 70. June of 1970. Mm -hmm. Now I think most of these you might check and see if uh, any of them indicated that he was running gas. Hmm. But most of them should have been fuel. I'm not, I'm not I don't even. think he knew how to run gas. <laughs> I got that way. 72.28 miles an hour. Ooh, BMC, that... B motorcycle. Yeah, it, that must have been gas, but uh, something happened. Hmm. Like I say, it was kind of a hit and miss deal. Mm -hmm. When he went fast, he went real fast, and uh, other times it was just kind of mediocre, something... There were times when he would uh, melt the engine, you know, have it too lean, and, mm -hmm. and several times you just put holes in the pistons. There's 138. Yeah, that's, motorcycles. that's respectable. That, but it d didn't say fuel. It says uh, FS. Yeah. F slash S. S. What's the S? I don't know. Streamline. Maybe there was a fairing on it at one time. I don't remember ever. Seeing it with a fairing. Hmm. Yeah. There's 140, 62. Yeah, that's that's a good one. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good one. Now, what was the class? Um, page, huh? Yeah, it looks like we're missing that page. Uh, that's dangerous. That was definitely fuel. Is there a date on that one? 68. One of the times I uh, ran a Lakester, we melted it down, put holes in both pistons. <laughs> Was he frustrated when that kind of stuff happened, or would he just go right no. back at it? And... No, he'd just go right back at it. I mean, it's, that's racing. Yeah. I, I try to do it a little more scientifically than that, because I can't afford to uh, buy Blow the pieces. The burn, <laughs> burn a bunch of pistons up. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of 68 records in here. Mm -hmm. So this might have been before you were out there. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Slover's porting services. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think I see any too much other. Yeah. They always had the motorcycles last, I guess, in these records. Yeah. I find it interesting, you know, he's racing from from these documents, you know, sixty seven to eighty three, you know. It's a mm -hmm. long period, especially with the same the same bike and the same motor. Yeah. But you think he could have been racing as early as the early sixties and the late fifties? I think so. Yeah. Here's a 57 miles an hour. <laughs> Maybe that's when he melted it down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was playing with it, trying to get it to go faster, but it just wouldn't quite do it. Right. <laughs> mm. I remember my first time at Bonneville, I thought I was going to set the world on fire, and I think I went 57 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big, steep learning curve out there. I remember one time, Keenan, uh, he was running nitrous and 30% nitro, and... Uh, with a single, and uh, the thing just wouldn't run, and finally he turned out after the quarter, 
and then it started running. So he went back around and got on the track again and went through the quarter again. So he got two quarter speed times and ended up going through it about 100 miles an hour. Well, that's cool. That is funny. And we were we were sitting on the line when he did that, and uh, Bill comes over and he says, he's shaking his head. You can't believe what Keenan just did. I said, I can believe it. What he did. <laughs> <laughs> Who was Keenan? Keenan Tatro. He's my uh, oh okay race partner. He he runs that single cylinder Harley. Right, right, right. He's got my record at he, the what record I want at Bonneville. Yeah, <laughs> the 500 cc modified vintage fuel. Yeah, he's uh, that's another hit and miss deal. You know, either go really fast or blow up, or go real fast and blow up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we spent a lot of time changing pistons and cylinders and. Uh -huh. Blows transmissions once in a while, so we work on the transmission between right. runs. And one time we blew all the gears out of the tranny, and we just stuck the thing in high gear, and we tow started it, and uh, <laughs> well, we kick started it, and then we towed it up to about 70 miles an hour, and then he got on it. And I don't think they let you tow motorcycles anymore a lot. Went 150 miles an hour. Another 134 mile an hour. Do you remember if the number on the bike, it's on the plate, it says 650? Do you remember if that was like maybe a class designation since it was a 650cc or would that have been his number? No, that was his number. Really? It was a 650 uh, motor and he said, well, that sounds like a good number to me, so I'll, my number is going to be 650. Huh. And nobody else had that number, so he ran that number. Remember Jim Drinker? Yeah. <laughs> He's uh, right he, next to Theo on this uh, 68 timesheet. Yeah. Remember what he ran? No. I know he didn't drink, though. <laughs> <laughs> he used to get razzed about that all the time. <laughs> I used to get, know a guy named Paul Stoner. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I knew a Tony Stoner. <laughs> he was a uh, he was in the military, and he retired a major. And I said, how did your troops feel about you being a major stoner? <laughs> <laughs> and he just glared at me. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Is this... Um, it's got some numbers down here, like 41 Theo owes an NT. No time. No time. That, that okay. Was a turnout. Yeah. The MC, the 41. Uh, it's either a, NT for no time or a TO for turnout. Mm. Yeah, there were there were a few a few turnouts and a few times he should have turned out. <laughs> you remember if he ever wrecked the bike? I don't think he ever wrecked the bike. Mm. But I know. It doesn't of. look like much has happened to it. Anyway. Yeah. Mm. There's another 130 mile an hour pass, 131. Yeah. Yeah. Here's some disqualified sidewinders. <laughs> Illegal body. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, this 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 is really really a piece of work. Well, we're gonna get it back out of the lake, and yeah, we're definitely gonna uh, keep you updated as to what we find. Yeah. We're gonna hopefully well, dig out need, the whole story. You need you know? some uh, help sorting out the tuning. Uh, yeah. That'd be more great. Than help, oh, well, happy to help you on it. Yeah. If uh, you know, I got plenty of Amol jets, and uh, if you want to run gasoline, we can uh, jet it for gasoline. Hmm. Maybe gasoline at El Mirage, and then uh, take it to Bonneville and run some run some fuel yeah. in it. Alcohol is real easy to run. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> nowadays, it's not even. Uh, I don't think it costs as much as gasoline. Hmm. So I think it's cheaper than gasoline. Yeah. Uh, if you want to start out with alcohol, it's not a problem. It's got the. Uh, the only thing is, if you're running fuel class, you have to have a uh, uh, fuel shutoff switch. Fuel shutoff. Right. So you'd have to uh, rig something up there. Mm-hmm. But uh, if you're running gasoline, all you got to do is change the tires and do some safety wire. Um, what do you think about the? Uh, and the, the primary. primary, you'd have to uh, do some work there. Yeah, it's one of the things they wanted to know was how are you going to keep your foot out of the uh, yeah. primary? <laughs> your feet are way back yeah, there. Your feet are way back yeah. there. That argument didn't make sense. Yeah. No, it's it's practically race ready the way it is. Mm -hmm. Check the inside of the tank and uh, make sure it's not too scuzzy. Or make yeah. some new uh, new cables for it just for the safe yeah, side. I wouldn't worry about it if, if they work. <laughs> look, look at this throttle cable. Oh, actually. 
No, wait, is it the clutch cable? Yeah, the yeah, clutch, the clutch cable's cable is a little bit vintage. Yeah, it looks like a, <laughs> it still works though, huh? Well, it goes one way. <laughs> it, goes one way. <laughs> it did before Bonneville. <laughs> yeah. We might do a new uh, pad too. That's that's yeah. a little uh, on the hard side. Yeah. And yeah, that one's mm. rough. Might fill that for yeah. a little while. That'll just take it off. Paint breaker. Yeah. I like how the maiden one's worn down, you know. Yeah, yeah, it'll polish up with a few runs. Yeah. Well, that's what we plan to do with it. Yeah. Uh, Wes, real quick, you, you got that sheet, you want to just check it, make sure? Yeah, let me take a look. Uh, just a After all these years, is there a reason you're still racing old motorcycles and, or vintage motorcycles compared to, um, you know, now getting something new and fast and... Like a Hayabusa? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I just don't like new motorcycles. Yeah. They don't have any class. If they don't have spokes and you can't kick them, they're not a motorcycle in my book. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's what I've run all my life, so why should I change? Yeah. It's, it's, it's fun. I'm not going 250 miles an hour, but I don't care. Yeah. My sons can ride the new motorcycles and go super fast, and I'll just bump along doing what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. My wife wants to get on it once in a while. That's fine with me. Hmm. And it's not that we haven't gone fast. I mean, uh, we've got one of the fastest uh, K models, Flatheads, uh, that's running, and uh, we have done 170 with that old Ironhead wow. engine, 1,000 yeah. cc. That's hauling groceries, man. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> a lot of people breaking records in the 1350 and 1600 uh, uh, cc classes going slower than 170. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like we haven't uh, paid our dues and uh, gotten down the, the road. And well, hopefully we'll uh, be out there seeing you, you know, later this year. Absolutely. Getting a little tuning advice with this thing. Yeah, at I least. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to go 140. <laughs> yeah. Well, even if you don't do anything to it, uh, bring it in and run it through tech just to see what they say. Yeah. yeah. You know? That's I think before we really start doing anything to it, yeah. you know, just to let them pick it apart. And then we don't want to change much of it, you know. Yeah, we want to. No, there's no reason to. It was very functional the way it was, and other than a few little safety uh, items, uh, it's it's should run just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did get it running and blasted up and down the parking lot a few times at my shop. Mm. That's, that's great. Everything worked great for the brakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he got a little carried away and almost went out in traffic on it. Yeah. Yeah. I would. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. two things. Um, ask him uh, if he has any like major Theo story or just whatever story he thinks of the, when, when he thinks of Theo, what stands out in his mind. Okay. Yeah. But what uh, what stands out in your mind most about Theo? Well, the thing that comes to my mind usually when I think about him is when he tried to get into the Lakester with his fire suit on and everything, and he instantly got, I got to get out of here, you know, get me out, get me out, you know. Yeah. I mean, he was just uh, uh, claustrophobic. so claustrophobic. And it was amazing to me that uh, the run he did make, that he was able to get into it and run it. But uh, I always think about that because it was it was comical because he got the suit on and everything, and uh, uh, he got into it, and you know they have to push you push your helmet back into the and as soon as as soon as they pushed his helmet back into the roll cage, he couldn't take it. I mean it was just like something hit. And he's let me out of here, let me out of here, and he just started grabbing the belts and unhooking the belts and everything, and and uh, he couldn't get out of there quick enough. And it was like I didn't think he wanted to go ever go in it again. Huh. And in fact, uh, we kept asking him, "You want to want to try it? You want to try it? No, no, you run it. No, you run it." Hmm. And it wasn't until we were just uh, we weren't in phase in line, and they were waiting too long in line, so uh, Theo got in it. But uh, that, that's the main thing I think about. But uh, just just the good times we used to have. We'd sit around the campfire, shooting the bull, and uh, laughing, and uh, you know, having a good time. And the, 
it was like uh, he just he fit the motorcycle like a glove. Like I say, my legs were a little long for it and a little bit awkward for me, but uh, Theo and his motorcycle were a unit. Hmm. And uh, he was always had a smile on his face and a real jovial guy, and uh, he'd give you the shirt off his back. Yeah. Like he kind of took me under his wing when I first uh, started running El Mirage. And I, when I first started running El Mirage, I was running a, a Roadster pickup with a flathead V8 or a, a Model A four banger in it. Mm -hmm. And he knew I had motorcycles, and he, he was the one that kept bugging me about bringing the motorcycles out. Yeah. And uh, so that's when I brought the old Ironhead Sportster out, and we just, uh, we were like that. Mm. <laughs> really good guy. A lot of people miss him. He had a lot of friends. But nobody could find him. Yeah. I think we're going to find him. Or at least yeah. tell the rest of the story. I, I, there's got to be, there's a, there's a big blank spot there that needs to be filled in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, start uh, start with Elmo Gillette and uh, some of the older rod riders, like I say, uh, John Helash. Yeah, He's, I'll have to get that phone number from you. Yeah, um, yeah there's, there's still several people who would remember him and possibly know what happened to him. Yeah, I was in the Rod Riders for 20 years, and then I transferred to the San Diego Roadster Club. Hmm. I've been in the Roadster Club for almost 20 years. So, uh, yeah, sure like to see this out on the lakes again. Yeah. Well, with any luck, you will. <laughs> no reason not to. Yeah. Uh, what would the uh, think about you guys on the bikes? Oh, he he just. Let me, let me ask you, <laughs> what do you think? Uh, what do you think Theo would think about us running the bike again? Oh, I think he'd just uh, look up and smile at us, you know, <laughs> or look down. I was gonna say, look up or look yeah. down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whichever way he went, he'd, he'd be ear to ear smiles. Yeah, yeah, that was that was his baby. Cool. What do you think, Hollywood? I think we're good. I thoroughly enjoy that. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Cut. Uh, Group hug. Yeah. Just you know, just be like, all right, well, we'll see you at the soft flats and just kind of just walk out of the scene. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Sure. See it. Uh, see the El Mirage. Thanks for you know, giving us the info. Okay. Yeah. Well, Fritz, I really appreciate you taking your time today and hooking us up with this uh, information and everything. Well, it's yeah. been my pleasure. Good. Thoroughly you know? enjoyable. And we're going we're gonna to see you at the lakes. Definitely. This, this has to be at the lakes this season. It's, it won't well, take gonna, that much to do it. We're going to give it our you. best shot I'll for sure. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely be calling you for some, for some advice. And if you remember anything else, yeah. then uh, we sure would like to know. And we'll fill you in yeah, on, the, on the story know. as we... Uh, as we figure it out. If the magneto's good, uh, just a matter of jetting those carburetors and you're running. Mm -hmm. I would normally tear the engine down and look at it, but uh, you've had it running and uh, if it, you don't hear the ring squeaking up and down in the cylinders. <laughs> it sounded great. <laughs> Triumphs are just, they're like that. <laughs> they can sit for 20 years and just like they were run the day before. A weekend in a sack full of hand tools and we'll be out on the lakes. Uh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a, a, a rigid Triumph up in the house there that uh, I'm actually going to put it back on the street, but it's basically the same as this. It was a bobber when I quit running it. It was a 500cc T100, and it mm -hmm. uh, broke a crankshaft, and I, I fixed it and put it back together and put about five or 600 miles on it, and then it broke another crankshaft. Hmm. So I got smart and put a later model crankshaft in it, yeah. and then I ran into... Uh, compression height on the piston problem, so mm -hmm. I did some juggling around and found some pistons that would almost come to the top of the bore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I never put it back together. I tore it down in about 1968, and it's been a part ever since. <laughs> My uh, son keeps bugging me. To, he wants to ride it. Yeah, I bet he does. Yeah. Well, thanks again. You're more than welcome. Happy to do it. Thank you.
So you already got safety wire on the clutch adjusters. Yeah. Let's see. 